This is a regime shift in Egypt. Th this is also a regime shift. It looks like a mountain, but the artist, uh, Matthew Najjar, has rearranged these Andes peaks to follow the, the ups and downs of the Dow Jones Industrial Average. There's something that happens right here. There's, there's a precipice, there's this cliff. This is about 2008. This is a regime shift. So regime shifts in a regime, we have a model, we have a process that behaves the way we expect it to. What the, the shift is when that breaks, when the process no longer follows the rules that we expect. The parameters move, we end up with a different model. So I'm an ecologist. I wasn't always an ecologist, I started in astrophysics. Uh, I didn't think it would take me here, digging for dinosaurs in the Nevada desert. We didn't get to go out in the helicopter, only the ichthyosaur flew out in the helicopter, we had to walk. Um, but it also brought me to meet this fellow, Peter Wainwright. Uh, as you can tell, Peter is really excited about fish in particular about fish jaws. And th this takes Peter all over the world. I don't get to go on these trips, but he has been diving in coral reefs around the globe, collecting as many of these different species of coral reef fish as he can. Now, Peter is interested in regime shifts too. The, the shift that he wants to understand is this one. How did we go from a jaw that looks like this to a jaw that looks like that. Now to an untrained eye, perhaps those jaws like mine, they'll, they'll, they'll look more or less the same. You're not exactly sure what's going on. I want to draw your attention to this, what's going on back here in this kind of fuzzy spot. That looks a bit fuzzy, but what you see there is there's an anvil and hammer. There's a whole nother jaw at the back of the throat of this fish. It's got a second jaw. And quite an aggressive one too. It looks like it's for grinding. So what could that have caused? These are the fish that have that. These are parrot fish, and they have jaws unlike any other fish. Most fish suck. That's not bad fish. They, they, they have to suck in their food. They live in water. It's a fluid. It's a great way to go, except for these guys. By having that second jaw, Peter believes they could release this constraint of having to be a suction feeder. You see, jaws do two things, right? They have to grind up your food, but then you also need them for prey capture. They have to acquire your food. Now, if you can make two copies, then one can evolve to become better and better at prey capture, and one can evolve to become better and better at just the grinding. So, so did we see a release of constraint, and is this responsible? Events like these duplications, whether they are genes or jaws, responsible for the sudden bursts of diversity that we see punctuate the tree of life? So how do we do this, right? Well, we like to be able to go back in time. I mean, short of going back in time, we like to be able to find fossils and say, reconstruct each of the evolutionary changes. But, but these are fish and we can't go to the desert and pull out all of those fossils and I don't get to go in the dives and they, they just aren't enough. We don't have the history that way. So we choose another way. We have this amazing diversity of fish that Peter has collected. Can we use the present day diversity to somehow reconstruct what has happened in the past? So each of the present day fish, we have the DNA. And following changes in their DNA patterns, we can construct their ancestry, just see how they are related, how they are evolved. And so this takes us back into the past. We use one or two of our fossils that we do manage to get to time calibrate this so that each of those branches is not proportional any longer to the number of mutational changes in their DNA sequences from which we made the tree, but it's proportional to time. So we know how they're related, but we still don't have the traits. We don't know what their jaws looked like in the past. We only know what their jaws look like in the present. So this is where our modeling process comes in. So how do we go from an evolutionary time series? That's what we want to reconstruct, the history of the process, when all we have is these tips up here. We've got the current day traits. Well, we have one more thing. We have a model of the process of evolution. Maybe a couple of models, because we don't know exactly what happened, and we're interested in seeing if we can distinguish between those models. So you take a candidate model, and you, you stick it at the bottom of the tree, and you kind of let this stochastic process evolve. Now, when you're on the same branch, you follow the same model. When you, when you hit a speciation point, you just get a different realization of the same stochastic process. Now, we can add a little twist in that. Occasionally, we can say, oh, I want to look for that shift. Let's change the model of the stochastic process, maybe change the color. Of course, if they're all different, you'll never get anything, but if you have a couple areas where you have some of the same, you don't think there's a shift, you can start to reconstruct a time series from present day, just to give a 
quick closer look at what that looks like. The model is something simple, an OU process perhaps, that says you, know, you start at some point, there's some optimum, but you're also perturbed by some random shocks. Perhaps this is different in each of the branches. You do a little bookkeeping. This is a little Edo integral. You have a wonderful thing called Edo isometry. This lets you add all of these things up and uh, solve this distribution that you expect to see here for a wide variety of processes. Now, it's nice and completely described by its first two moments. So you have an expectation. You have a covariance. Covariances can now stand in for our time series. So the, what the candidate models look for for this, imagine a very simple model, something like, but like a random walk. The traits just go wherever they want, drifting in space. Nothing selecting on them. You see then that would occur into this big picture of diversification. The present day species would sit here. And the covariances would tell us what rate that has occurred in. We'd reconstruct a simple history. Perhaps we want that to be constrained though, right? We said suction uh, feeding is a constraint. You can't do whatever you want. So it pulls you down to the constraint of suction feeding at some optimum. Again, that's almost what we want, but we want to change this model one more time. When we reach the parrot fish, we want to release that constraint. We let go that spring that pulls you back. All of a sudden, can we see if we can find evidence for this model over either of the prior candidates? There's another wrinkle, of course. Evolution may not release that constraint, but could still see a higher diversity if everything just started evolving faster, right? That would look something like this. Not exactly the same process, but imagine if you're standing here, it could be pretty hard to tell them apart. So we have a set of candidate models. We have our question that we want to tell them apart. We need to see, now that we have this wonderful phylogeny of, say, 212 different species of coral reef fish, is there enough information to distinguish between each of these options, in particular, this one in which evolution has simply sped up, and this one in which the jaw has allowed this constraint of suction feeding to be released. I use an approach called phylogenetic Monte Carlo. It's a relatively straightforward thing in which we're fitting each of the models, simulating under both of the models and comparing them. We end up with these distributions at the bottom. These, to the extent to which these overlap, tell us how well we're going to be able to tell our models apart. So, just. This is a pairwise comparison between those two models. If they overlap completely, sorry, we have no information. We just won't be able to answer our question. If we can pull those two distributions apart, then there is the information out of those covariances that can explain uh, which of those two models is better. If that, we can then find evidence that the regime shift model is better, we have found our release of constraint. Of course, the story ends well. Uh, Peter's intuition is very right. And these are just two distributions for two traits, the kinetic transmission ratio and the open jaw, opening jaw ratio. And in both of these cases, uh, for these functional traits that determine how well you are at suction feeding, we find clear evidence that there was a release of constraint and not simply accelerating evolution or the other model. So regime shifts in ecology and evolution come from lots of places. This fellow, Alan Hastings, he's actually my advisor. He's not often seen on a lake, um, but he thinks about this kind of regime shift. What we have here is a time series. We've been excited to finally have a time series and not have to worry just about covariances. These are the cod populations going back to 1850 in the North Atlantic based on fishing landings. And, and you can see something happen here that kind of reminds us of those, those peaks we started out with. There's this precipice here. The North Atlantic cod fishery was closed in 1994. The thing that gave that peninsula in New England its name, the fish were gone. Uh, there are many of these kinds of transitions. So corals can go from this beautiful color and vibrant coral reefs everywhere. Many of them are very suddenly switching to this desolate landscape where the corals are just bleached, white and dead. Closer to home, or closer to here, the Potomac River, shown on the left there, uh, has eutrophied. This just past April, this other photo was taken. Algae suddenly come up in such great numbers that the whole part of the river is fluorescing there, and no fish can grow. So there's these sudden shifts. So they look like that time series I showed with the cod. Unfortunately, Alan wants to make this problem harder. We don't want to tell the shift after it's happened. We want to predict is this shift about to happen? Is there an early warning sign that we are approaching one of these sudden shift points? The, the basic concept goes like this. So you say, well, why would you expect a sudden shift? Why, why would the process not be gradual? Many of the times that that happens, even though these are very different systems, 
there's a common mathematical structure, and that structure is a bifurcation process. So if you imagine that your system is sitting in a state that is stable, it keeps on going back there, it's been unperturbed, and it just sits there for a while, so here it's sitting in there, and I'm slowly changing the environment in which it lives. So here it remains stable, it remains stable. All of a sudden, there's a point at which this stable point where it's been happy vanishes. That's the bifurcation. All, the, suddenly, a, the ball that has been able to remain in the happy stable state rolls away into the undesirable state. So there's a sudden shift. So we want to exploit the common mathematical structure in each of these systems to develop a warning signal that will tell us a change is about to occur. Now, we often don't have a more detailed model like we were able to in the cases of the evolutionary models that, that describes the process. So we don't know all the details, but we're gonna make this work for us because that will, many of the same generic features may show up in different cases, even though if we had the detailed models, they, they would not look alike at all. So how, do, how well do we do this? Well, the models look rather similar to our previous case. They're in continuous time, but Again, all we really need is a simple return process, um, and from that process, we're going to say, do we, can we choose a model in which the parameter is slowly changing and making the system become less stable against a model in which the system is not losing that stability? There are certain features that will come out of this, for instance. You can expect that if the model is losing its stability, that the autocorrelation time, the time if you think about this ball rolling back and forth, in its perturbed environment that it takes to come back each time. It's getting longer and longer. You can think about the variance of that ball rolling back and forth. You know, here it's held in its well pretty well. As this flattens out, it can move around farther. But we don't want to look at simply a summary statistic of the process. We want to capture, you know, exactly that description in math, which we have done here. So this is a bit more intentional. Um, I was lucky to get 50,000 hours on Carver to run the comparisons between these models. And again, we can pull out the differences. There's not a perfect, you know, we can't do this with perfect probability, right? The distributions still overlap. You're never gonna get an answer that says, I can predict with full certainty that a dramatic shift is about to happen before it's happened. But we can get these probabilities. We've turned it from, oh, it's possible that there might be a cliff there, to a probability that a cliff is there. We've gone from, from this to this, to, to a place where we can start using the methods and tools of decision theory to decide what the best option is, because now we have probabilities. The, the unknowns are known, are quantifiable. There's, there's some common features in these regime shift problems I just wanted to remind you of. So in both cases, there is a weak signal there. There's, you know, either I don't have, the shift happened long ago, and I don't have the time series, or, um, the shift has hap it's not yet happened, and I'm just looking for a hint that it's about to happen. So we need to quantify our uncertainty in each of these cases. We need to do this model choice problem. And that's where the computational intensity is really coming from, right? That we have to go through each of these models and compare them. Uh, there's also a data intensivity that's introduced by that, right? Our only ability to distinguish between those models requires having enough data. Uh, so I wanted to shift gears and close with just kind of some thoughts that I've developed throughout my time here at CSGF. Um, it came originally with one of the, the first keynotes that I saw, in which we talked about the, the way that we go about doing these problems. As an incoming student, you try to reproduce what other people have done to get your field, and then you start kind of modifying that and moving forward. And um, th this struck me as a, as a very persuasive idea in why we make our code open source in the first place. It makes all of this easier, right? We can have friends then help us out. We can reproduce other people's research faster. Uh, many eyes make all bugs shallow, and then you can grab existing software and extend it. And so I thought, what if we take that and kind of apply it elsewhere in our scientific process? You know, not just our code, but um, how we read, uh, where our discussions are, and just what we're doing day to day. So my entire research process for the past few years, I have documented day to day in a laboratory notebook that I've kept online, that I've kept open. Um, this has given some of my professors cause for concern. They get to write me great emails like, this is very exciting, but I please don't think that you should put it on the notebook yet. Then maybe a couple hours later, they get another email saying like, oh, I realize you're gonna do that anyway, so you may as well go ahead. 
Uh, so, so it's been frightening, but it's been exciting as well. You get, I've gotten lots of interesting collaborations that have emerged from this that have helped me tackle those problems of not having enough data to pull those models apart. Because people have discovered, oh, there's someone else working on a problem that's just like this. So I'll just put that out there. You can go and find the lab notebook if you Google for me. And uh, that's the thought. So there's lots of people to thank. My advisor, Alan Hastings, the Center for Population Biology. Uh, Nimbus is an institute for mathematics and synthesis of biology at Tennessee. Uh, NERSC Supercomputing, of course, the DOE uh, CSGF, and uh, the Berkeley Lab for my practicum. Thank you. <laughs>